On March 22, 1881, in the city of Kumbach, Germany, a boy is born that they name Hans, Hans Wilsdorf. Hans had two brothers, one older than him and one younger, and his father had a good job because in his city, he used to sell different types of metals. Everything was going good until Hans' mother dies, and only one year after this happens, his father dies as well. And at this point, Hans is only 12 years old. These three brothers had basically turned into an orphan, and their uncle were their guardian now. The first thing Hans' uncle does is sell his dad's shop, put him in the bank, and put these three kids in a high-level boarding school. Hans really hated this school because his family was Protestant Christian and the school was mainly Catholic. And because of his different religion, he was constantly bullied. Even though Hans didn't like the school and his classmates, but he would study. And alongside his school, he would learn French and English. And his main language was obviously German. Hans didn't know anything he's learning is good, but the main thing that's gonna help him out for the rest of his life is the two languages he's learning. Learning these two languages was basically the major key in his success. Since he knew other languages other than German, he befriended a Swiss kid, and the Swiss kid only spoke French, and that is why Hans became his friend. Hans' new friend would always tell him about his hometown in Switzerland. The city of La Chance de Fons is a city that builds and repairs watches, and a lot of specialists are from there. The thought of being a watchmaker stays in Hans' head since that day, and he always found it interesting. Time passes and he graduates high school, and his uncle tells him to go to college. Hans declines his offer and says, I want to go to Geneva to get the job that I always wanted. With his uncle's permission, he eventually goes to Switzerland. The first job he gets is in a pearl jewelry store, and his main job was being a salesperson since he knew three different languages. It doesn't take that long before Hans becomes the top salesman in that jewelry store, and he was getting very good commission out of it. And for a 19-year-old, he was making great money. Days pass, and Hans Wilsdorf continue working, but he had found a couple friends, and one of them suggests to quit this job and come work in the new watch company called Kuno Korten, and they will probably pay you more than this place. Kuno Korten used to build pocket watches, especially luxurious ones, and at that time, pocket watches were very in fashion for men. When his friend suggested working at a watch store, he was reminded about school and his Swiss friend talking about watchmaking. When he remembers what his classmate told them about watchmaking and how there is a job opening in this company, a new passion was forming inside Hans, and he decides to quit this job to get the job at the watchmaking place. When he went to get the job at Kuna Korten, and they realize he knows three different languages, he was immediately hired as a salesperson. And when he was hired, his salary was 80 Swiss francs a week. And for that time, for his age, it was actually a pretty nice paycheck. Hans was so fascinated by mechanical watches that when a repair came in, he would watch the watchmaker to see what he does to repair it. After a while, when he was not busy, he would even take the watch apart himself to figure it out. Hans is very happy with his job, and day by day he's learning new things about watchmaking, and he reaches 20 years old. When he has to go to the army, even though he lived in Switzerland, he was a German citizen, and he had to go to Germany to serve the army for two years. He served his country for two years, and when he was finished with the military, he decided to go to the richest town in that era, and that's London. When he gets to London, the first watch place hires him, just because he knew three different languages, and he knew what he was talking about so the owner really liked him. And because of the languages, he was also hired as a salesperson. When Hans started working, he pretty much knew everything about watches, how they work, how you repair them. He knew everything about them. He loved doing this so much that he would always tell himself that I could design and create my own watch. And it's around this time where he meets a girl, Florence Francis May Crotty, 
and they get married fairly quickly after meeting. Han's wife had a brother named Alfred James Davis, which was much older than these two, and you could say he was kind of rich. When Alfred Davis gets to know Hans, he realizes how passionate he's about watches, and he pretty much knows anything you need to know about a watch. And that is why he suggests, since you know so much about watches and how they work, why don't you create your own? And he tells him he should start working, and he'll help him with any funds he needs. A few years later, in the year 1905, Hans and his brother-in-law create a new company, a company named Wilsdorf and Davis. Oops. After a few years, this name will be turned into Rolex, but we'll get to that. Hans doesn't start creating watches from the back. He starts creating the most important part of a mechanical watch, and that's the movement. The first company that buys the Wilsdorf and Davis movement was a Swiss company called Hermann Aigler, and they used to build luxurious watches back then. Hans loved wristwatches, but you have to know that in this era, they're only made for women, and they're not well made, so they're not as precise as a pocket watch. Pocket watches were extremely in fashion, and a lot of men had them, and they were extremely luxurious and well made, and they were way bigger, so it was easier to build an exact movement for it. Hans always told himself he wants to create a small wristwatch with the precision of a pocket watch, in a way where every man would want this watch, but he still hadn't gotten there. When he was building movements for different companies, he was always working towards making this movement smaller, but keeping the same precision. So it was the same precision, but just smaller. Han's patience paid off, because he really got the results he wanted. Eventually, in the year 1908, he successfully creates a wristwatch that has the same precision as a luxurious pocket watch, but it's a small wristwatch made for men. He worked so hard on how it worked mechanically, that he made something extremely luxurious, and you couldn't find anything better in the market at that time. He calls Davis and tells him, with the wristwatch we have created, we could really expand the company. We just have to get rid of our last names and put something that's classy and rememberable. They thought of many different names, but none of them would stick, and then eventually, Wilsdorf makes up a name that's extremely classic, Rolex. Rolex is a name that sounds good, is luxurious, and most importantly, it's hard to forget. And after getting this name, Hans and his brother-in-law change the name of the company to this. Everything is going well, and Rolex is becoming more and more famous each day. But in the year 1914, World War I has begun. After this took place, most watch companies went out of business because nobody was buying watches at this time. And it's interesting to know that the only watch company that grows during World War I is Rolex. But why is that? Because the German army was looking for exact precise watches for their officers, and they had realized that the best watches were made by Rolex, and they had ordered plenty of them for the army. And in a place where everybody's going out of business, for Rolex, the business is booming. You have to note that in this time, Rolex was located in London, England. And when the British government realized that people are selling too much goods during the war, and they're exporting them, they put a hefty tax on exports. They put a 33% tax on anything that exported outside of the country. But anything that's sold inside, it doesn't get that tax. When Hans realizes that this is the tax rate they want to charge him, he decides to leave the country, and he moves to Switzerland. Even before they put this hefty tax, he had plans of leaving England, because it's World War I, and he was a German, and the British people were not a fan of the Germans at this time, and that is why he decides to move to Switzerland. They go to Geneva and get an office there, and it's interesting to know that the same office they rented is the same headquarter they have right now, but it's much more modern and bigger. The headquarter was in Geneva, but the factory was in Bien, and they moved it there. Rolex is getting so popular that every country in Europe is very aware of this brand, and after this time, they're getting to know it as a very prestigious, high-quality brand. In the year 1926, 
Rolex shocks the world once again. The first shock was basically the precise mechanical wristwatch for men. The second shock was the Rolex Oyster, the first waterproof watch. This news really shocked the world because they couldn't believe that a watch like this could be waterproof. But since Rolex was the name of the watch and they had a good reputation, everybody believed it and a lot of people bought it. It seems like Hans was born for this job. He was good at business, he was a good manager, he was a self-made engineer and a watchmaker, and on top of that, he also was a master of marketing. In the year 1927, Hans realizes that there is a swimmer by the name of Mercedes Gleitzer, and she was such a good swimmer that she could swim through the English Channel. She was deciding to do this once again, and the news got to Hans Wilsdorf. He sends a letter to Mercedes and tells her to wear this watch around your neck while you're swimming. And she agrees. Back then it wasn't like today where you should sponsor me, pay me, talk to my lawyer. They wouldn't really do it for money. They would do it to break the record. She swims for over 10 hours with the oyster around her neck and she eventually gets to England. When they inspected the oyster, they realized that after 10 hours of swimming in the sea, no water had gotten into the watch and all the news reporter was present and they were reporting this. The water being waterproof and its success made it get more publicity than Mercedes Glitze by breaking the record. So a lot more people were talking about the watch rather than her. Hans wasn't always trying to create watches for rich people. He wanted to make watches that everybody could buy and use not to sit around. And that is why all the advertisement you see is someone doing something cool or crazy like climbing a mountain, swimming, racing, and vice versa. When we get to 1931, Hans shocks the world once again by producing the Oyster Perpetual. We all know automatic watches where you don't have to adjust it. But at that time, this was the first automatic watch that was also waterproof. Hans was always trying to avoid hearing his name somewhere and whenever the name Rolex was around, he didn't want his name to be associated with it. Why is that? Because most of his customers were from the UK, France and the US, the biggest enemy to Germany. And Hans Wilsdorf was very German and everybody would realize where he's from. Anyways, World War II ends and Rolex is an extremely popular brand. Rolex had gotten to a point where when you ask somebody, tell me a luxurious watch, everybody would say Rolex. And right now, it's the same thing. There are a lot of luxurious watches, but everybody says Rolex. Unlike other companies, when Hans Wilsdorf dies in the year 1961, he turns the company into a trust. The Hans Wilsdorf Foundation to be exact. The foundation basically makes it a quote unquote non-profit organization, which it doesn't make money, but it really does make money. So it's just a cover up to pay less taxes. And another thing, by doing this, the company cannot be sold by any family members. Giant companies like this usually enter the stock market, which they get extremely rich, but they lose a little bit of control usually. But Rolex is still under the Wilsdorf family. When a company enters the market, they get more powerful and richer. But just like we say, they lose a little bit of control. In a trust, you don't get as rich as a stock market, but you have 100% control. We also have to say that in the year 1953, Rolex released one of their most popular watch, which is one of the most popular watches to this day, the Rolex Submariner. And it comes from Submarine because it could go down up to 100 meters and the watch wouldn't take any damage. It's good to know when this watch was released, it was $150 each. And if you calculate it with inflation, it's about $1,250. If you want to buy the 2023 version, you have to pay well over $10,000, but that's MSRP. And that's if they sell one to you. Because Rolex, just like hypercar market, they have created a very shady business tactic. Like for example, they release a watch for 2023 and say we're only selling this many for this year. The customers are either reserved it from years ago 
or they got the party and they get it quickly. So all the watches are sold in the first minute. They have a huge price increase, sometimes over $20,000 for a $10,000 MSRP watch. This price stays that high until another news comes out that this watch is gonna be released or not released anymore. If they produce more, the price and the value of the watch goes down. But if they announce that they're not gonna make it anymore, it will go up drastically. A lot of watch enthusiasts have stopped purchasing Rolex watches because of this, and they don't like because you have to pay extra for a watch that costs way less. And they are extremely sad about this because they're giant Rolex fans, but they really have no access in buying one at a fair price.